everybody's. I'm in the house. I can't sing right now. Ah. <laughs> the kids are sleeping, so this is tame, sexy business, Kyle. 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 Kyle tonight. Uh, <laughs> how are you doing, baby? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's gonna be the Barry White of D D tonight. That's it. Uh folks, it's Tuesday night. Welcome aboard. You know what that means between the roles, our stab at a talk show. Uh we appreciate you joining us. We've got a pretty good topic tonight, uh, as well as some great recaps on uh some fantastic games that we played uh first off you know the drill follow us on twitch follow us on twitter take a look at our youtube archive if you want to support us by buying our crap or uh just shoot the shit with D on our discord both those links are down below most importantly if you want to join us on the talk show or on one of the one shots m hobo inc uh twitter gmail hit us up let us know we will get you in uh shout out to pirate dog dice for dice that uh, are really gonna deal some damage this sunday uh and of course oddfishgames.com if your game stinks grab a little adventure sense and make it smell a whole lot better don't forget uh not this sunday uh but the following sunday is uh how to RPG with your cat. The link will be on our Twitter handle. And don't forget, it's completely free. All you got to do is sign up to let them know that you're coming. That being said, let's introduce us to your cast this evening. Uh, (laughs) Spoiler alert, it's the same cast as last week. Uh, David, start us off. Hi, I'm David. (laughs) Um, I've been a regular here on Between the Rolls, and I'm a regular on our Thursday night show, Cacophony. And I got and I was fortunate enough to play in the, this past Saturday's one shot. So, but uh, I usually play Zadar on the Cacophony show. So, very good. Howdy, next, folks. Next up is our tumbleweed between two sets of buildings. Carol. What the hell does that even mean? Oh, my Lord. Okay, here's the pile of dog poop between two sewer lines. Carol. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is that better? Is that better or is that worse? Better or worse? I'm the rose. Well, see, I guess I'm the rose. <laughs> Between the, the thorns? I don't know. There's three there thorns. Go. I can't be in the middle. So, hi, everyone. My name's Carol. I'm a commission mini painter, longtime gamer, and occasional GM, and I GM this past weekend. I also play Taryn, uh, the bard extraordinaire in the campaign. I can't wait till this weekend. She's so psyched. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last, Fox. last but certainly not least is Kyle. Kyle, tell us about yourself. Oh, hey there. I'm Kyle. And I play Dewey Dacamel on the campaign. Quick, do the hand thing. Oh, I'm out of ideas. There you go. <laughs> Best line of Carl Weathers' his career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and that starts uh, Friday. 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 Yeah, when it does Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, we will not be broadcasting on Friday. So, feel free to watch The Mandalorian. You got it. That's, we care. That's why we aren't going to do it. Uh, tonight, we've got a uh, recap on three different games this past week. Uh, we will start off with our standard Cacophony edition, which is always on Thursday. That was entitled uh, Petrix Palace, episode 162. David, take it away. Pesky Petrix Palace. Oh, how's that for alliteration, folks? Uh, <laughs> it was a great episode. Um, we started out with uh, Camille, Daphne, and Zadar being... <clears throat> were we were we sleeping or was it real early or something like that? Good I think morning. we were just yeah we were just relaxing around the bungalow when suddenly there's a bang on the door. The door gets kicked in and there is a smoking hortense. Uh, they're uh, telling us that we are needed down at the docks now. So <laughs> so we ventured out to the docks. Uh, we talked to the dock master. They tell us there's a problem, and there is how do you pronounce it? Cadre or cadre of cadre. Barbar- yeah, of barbarians waiting for us on the docks. They want us to rescue their diplomat, uh, Hepta, <coughs> and uh, they, I don't know, <laughs> persuade us very, <laughs> you know, with a 
high intimidation roll and money uh, to get us to the ship uh, and inform us that Hepta is actually inside an idol that mistakenly, well, accidentally got knocked overboard. <laughs> so unfortunately, when this idol is introduced to water, it expands. So it expanded to roughly about a 50 foot tall statue submerged underwater. So we had to swim down, find entry into the place, get inside. And yeah, that's when the, this house of horrors ensued. <laughs> so uh, we make our way th through this fun house and uh, get assaulted by Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> Uh, on our on our quest to find the uh, Hepta inside hey. this palace, <coughs> style nice. So anyway, <laughs> we make our way in through this uh, this these halls of horror. Now I'm exaggerating. This is actually a pretty nice place, but it just got some serious hazards in it. So, but uh, very much. Uh, I want to say uh, plains dwelling folk uh, themed on the inside of this palace. You know, it also has opulent uh, sections too. And then we ran into the uh, hanging critters were about to uh, be prepared or were waiting to be prepared for dinner. Uh, they animate and then, yeah, that's when the Psych damage starts kicking in. Zadar almost dies. Frank, are you okay? You okay? You've come up with some really dark stuff lately with the, the kerosene bodies and, oh, I and now dead things coming back to life. Mm -hmm. I think the key to that you, feature you was Sarah McLaughlin singing in the background. Yeah, that the was arms probably of the yeah. angel. That song was stuck in my head all night. In anyway. the arms of Haunting. The I, I'm just trying to haunt you because it's. October Halloween. Yeah, it was haunting. So, so anyway, we find Hepta. She is not pleased, especially to find out that her palace is now underwater. So, oh yeah, that's right. And uh, Cammy made a boyfriend. So yeah, huge barbarian. Yeah, much Wait, huger he after he met. March, March huger, Wait. more turgid after after they met. Did, get, did she actually get lucky at the end of the session? Uh, no, no. It wasn't his calf that she was touching. <laughs> yeah, it's a mighty thews. So, so anyway, to round up the episode, we managed to uh, uh, help uh, get out of the statue. The statue reduced down the size. Yeah. Accidents happen. Now a dock is destroyed in Cacophony. And next episode, we will have to answer for that. So, see, I thought you were going to say accidents happen and nine months later. Uh, got to no. talk to Cammy about that. <laughs> that's, right. that's that's Cammy's issue, not his. Yeah, uh, yeah poor, uh, we'll call her Fumbolina, dropped the idol and destroyed one of the docks. <laughs> Fumble, Fumbalaya. <laughs> way, way to go, Caitlin. <laughs> They call her danger prone Daphne, you know. Yes, Daphne. Yeah, that's true. Danger prone Daphne. I love that. Oh my that, god. Yeah, Dane, that's what I've I've heard that character called not Caitlin's character, but Daphne. Well, that's who she is. So danger prone Daphne. Yes. Uh <laughs> next up was episode 163, Dance okay. Macabre, uh run by mm. Carol, played by uh the rest of us, as well as DJ Carol. Uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. Dance Macabre. It's going to be weird talking about a game I GM'd rather than played. So. Yeah, it's always weird when you talk, but that's okay. <laughs> we manage. It's awesome to talk. Who is he kidding? So anyways, let's see. What the fuck happened? Uh, so I can... So yeah, what the fuck happened? You wrote it. <laughs> you wrote it, so you should know. No, to be I fair, everyone in that know. room was talking over her the entire time. I was drunk, so I have could. a very valid reason. <laughs> okay, so Frank is a really good thing of why drinking and gaming is not the best idea. I mean... It's the only thing I can do to survive fun. your stupid story. <laughs> 
Oh. Yeah, you That's a little harsh. <laughs> you, I, I guess I, it could be best described it, as undead Mardi Gras, right? Didn't we decide that? Yeah. That's a good description. It is like, well, it's sort of undead Gras. So basically what the story is, and of course the PCs, these PCs didn't actually bother to find out the story, which was, you know, might have been helpful. Oh, PC is hey, not hey. doing their research. Oh. I'm sorry. I was trying to be helpful. No one wants to run a three hour session, apparently. So we had to cut the story. Actually, I didn't. Well, here's the thing I didn't cut the story. I originally wrote it for two hours with those two, with the two encounters. I actually lengthened it to run with my friends where we didn't have a two hour time slot. So that's, and it's actually gotcha. for the two hour time slot. So what happened was the part, basically there is a uh, fall festival that goes on in this town called Mellis. Did anybody actually get what Mellis was? It's uh, spelled backwards. Yeah, it's Salem, yeah, Salem spelled backwards. And I went to school at Salem, you know, Salem, Mass, which is Halloween Central. So I'm like, ah, I should definitely throw, a, throw that reference. Also, I mentioned too, if somebody played a black tabaxi, it would have been appropriate because of the Sabrina, the teenage witch re reference with her. Because she doesn't like the bagsies. Oh, she's her familiar as a black cat named Sam. So anyways, so yes, we had, we had, we had these three guys here and my best friend, DJ, who brought some sanity to this party. Uh, and David. I thought I was the best friend. Yeah, yeah. You were, I know I was not. You were, Okay, Jody. <laughs> so basically, there's a fall festival that happens. Think of like your state fairs and such, you know. So you've got games and all sorts of things. But at night, yeah. there is this, there is this uh, event that everybody shows up to see called the Dance Macabre, which is all the spirits in the graveyard rise up <laughs> and to a violinist. Uh, and what the deal was about 50 years ago, uh, this necromancer came through town and raised up all the dead because he's trying to build an army. Mm -hmm. And the, viol the necromancer's always guys. What's that? It, Cammy is not a guy. She's not I guy. know. That's why I well, enjoy actually, Cammy's why character. Did, why did you assume gender? I don't, I'm not sure if I actually said he or she. I you did say he, because oh. I'm not assuming he. gender. You are, apparently. That's Tamlin. He's the shit lord. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You're I've just the racist shit lord. He's the uh, sexist shit lord. <laughs> okay, so the necromancer really is a plot device they threw in there to, to 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 you know to create the backstory. The necromancer does not show up in this in this scenario though, because he would pretty much freaking wipe the floor with the party. Uh, so, anyways, they, so yes, basically, uh, basically the the bard, the finest, <laughs> went and talk to a master instrument um, instrument maker who they made this violin and imbued it with magic to call all the spirits back to the graveyard. And every every Halloween for three nights, there's this fest, basically this dance happens to re-up the rituals to keep everything there. However, the necromancer who obviously wants his little army of undead and likes to have them go out and wreck the world uh, basically had one of his underlings that the wards on the violin have been weakening over time and he figured out how to get through them. So he sent a servant to go and broke the wards, took the violin and took off. He didn't get very far though. So thank, thankfully, otherwise, you know, then this would be a lot longer than a two hour scenario. So he was in a house just outside of town. Now the PCs go to this go to this particular part of the festival and out walks the keeper or it's the violinist and she does not have a violin and of course all the townspeople know what that means and run away and go hide behind locked doors because it means that the spirits are going to be able to break out of the graveyard and start causing trouble in the town although the first night they can't do much there's still a little lingering magic left as the nights progressed they would get worse and if it didn't come back by the end of the third night, the spell would be broken and the spirits would just be totally free to do whatever they wanted, which means going and destroying the town. So they had three days to do it. 
it only took them what, what it only took them basically a couple hours because they went at night there are options with this thing it's kind of a sandbox thing they you know that they could have done but and that's fine they they took the straight shot and it's you know it's a little harder if you go at night than during the day because the monster at the end is not in, is uh, vulnerable to sunlight so you could have broken the boards during the day and weakened it uh but anyway so the, the first thing they did is they <laughs> investigate the crypt that she sleeps in and they found they found a clue in there as well as a couple of suits of animated armor or did i reanimate both i don't remember no i don't yes. think I no i didn't animate them both i only did one because of time i was outside Skeletons. i don't remember yeah, no, you were outside. Well, you came in eventually. You came in. You came in after, at like, round two. It, Frank was basically there just to cause trouble and make my life And help. teabag people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so basically, uh, there were a couple of skeletons you. and a suit of animator <laughs> that had fight uh, inside that came alive as soon as, basically, the sun set. Uh, so... The, and then, but said they found a clue. They found a little piece of dark blue cloth that did not come from the keeper. She wears all black, and all her stuff is yes, tattered and such. But this was deep blue, and she recognized that as uh, one of the uniforms, so to speak. I actually, in the other game, I was able to get it out there that that of course this guy, you know, having a bit of a god complex, and you know, he he dresses up his his minions in in like tabards and such. So it was one of his recognizable, you know, it was, it was definitely a piece of cloth and it was old and it had fallen off when he took the violin. So then they had to go and they had to ask about town to get clues to where maybe that violin and this baddie were, were hiding out because she said it's somewhere nearby and to the West. And you guys basically had to make a diplomacy, uh, was it diplomacy checks? I was busy uh, being an asshole. I don't recall. Yeah, a persuasion check. Sorry. Persuasion, persuasion checks. I, That's where the channel divinity came in. Yeah. Persuasion checks to uh, get somebody to open their door. And basically the persuasion checks were to determine how much time it passed rather than, you know, guarantee to get the info. Because this is a time, th even if it's three days, it's a time thing. And said so they could have gone a lot. Well, they could have gone to bed and done this all the next day so i you know i keep track of time but you guys did it really you guys did it fairly expeditiously i think <sighs> most people roll it really well i think frank was the only one that rolled like shit on that check and you found out so then you found out that it was the old bartley farm to the west side of town that had been abandoned for about 50 years imagine that everything's about 50 years uh so you guys go there and you you Get, you, you get into the farm and there's nothing in it until you get to the second floor. And in the second floor in the large bedroom, there was a, what the hell's it got? Uh, fuck, what the hell's the name of the baddie? The white, it's um, a deathlock white. Deathlock white, yeah. As like as a deathlock white. And a couple of- Where'd zombies. you grab it from? I asked you that on Saturday, but I oh, never recalled getting the it's, answer. It was on, it's on D and D Beyond, and I have access to the book, so that's where I just snagged that off of. Tomb of but Foes. I have. If you remind me later, I'll or probably I can look, Tomb of Foes. I imagine. Uh, I said I can look it up now, but um, I'll get through the rest of the I'll story. Wait. So, no. basically, <laughs> so basically. Frank ended up, what, you stayed on the front, uh, on the first floor. I guarded the rear. <laughs> he's fucking around with a mouse. Because, of course, he's playing a tabaxi, so he's fucking around with a mouse, which is, okay, that works. On well, camera. The other, upstairs. Yeah, in real life, too. DJ's monk, uh, Mortley, opened, he opened the correct door. He opened the left side door and found the three baddies. I believe Jody opened the right side and found nothing. Wasn't it you that opened the other door? I was and because I sprinted to open the towards other door. <laughs> So, but anyways, the fight commenced. Um, I managed to get the fear. Uh, I managed to get the fear spell off. Although the only person I was able to get was was Mortley, was DJ's uh, cleric, Poor which Mortley. is funny because he managed to turn the two zombies, and they were in the the corner cowering. 
But then he had to run out of the room and the zombies could actually come out and join the fight. <laughs> for all the good it did, because I think my dice rolls just totally freaking sucked. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was frustrating. But, you know, especially when when I wanted to freaking kill Frank's character, but he didn't even freaking show up until like uh, till almost the end. Uh, basically, Jody just walked right by the uh, big bad and grabbed the violin and was going to walk out and found out the big bad had Misty step and stepped right in front of him. And after that, Mortley made his save and got back in there pretty quickly. Uh, which drove the two zombies back to the corner because the the uh, turn undead was still going, and I think the best part was Frank said the, the Frank the Chaos Bomb decided to go in there and try to take the violin from Jody. However, Jody had very smartly put up a Sanctuary as a spell. Sanctuary. <laughs> so. Poor Frank, or Humanus, which is your character's name. Uh, poor Humanus, he rolled a nat 20 to steal it from him. And then, but uh, basically, Jody deemed that that was an attack. And I'm like, well, then you have to make a save against the sanctuary. And he rolled like a two. So he did not get the violin. <laughs> we which is, in fact, bullshit, no, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Nope, nope, nope. You could have used that net twenty to hit the monster, you, you know. But no, we would. I would have allowed it. Are you I done? personally do not like wasting nat twenty, so I would totally allowed you to actually turn it on the monster and and take a swipe at it. Uh, nope, I want to. But instead, so he so basically he was going to take the violin and hit it and try to destroy the beast with the violin, but. What happened instead was Jody took the violin and he, he did, I think, take down the, I don't remember if he's the one that took it down. Or was it you, David, that took it down? I nat 20 did. You nat 20 did, yeah. But he, but before that happened, Jody did take the violin and hit him with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, oh God. So they're going to friggin' screw up the entire scenario. I got to figure out a way out for this, but, uh, but the thing of it is, Jody also being a paladin has smite, you know, has smitey or mm. smite, and he basically could channel smite through the violin, and that did work. So sorry, Frank, but but that actually made that attack a lot more effective by having Jody do it. I was gonna try uh, and break it. However, it's right, G uh, Gabe. Gabe was the one that got the nat twenty, who had the uh, how do you want to do it moment, as they say. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, but they don't watch this show, so so I feel safe. Yet. But um, I figured since you know four of us here, including DJ, watch that uh, and enjoy it, I figured I'd throw it in there. Uh, but yes, yeah, so so basically, Gabe with a nat twenty took out the uh, the the white, and after that, I was like, well, the two because it was getting late, the two zombies just kind of you know, deflated. <laughs> they kind of crumbled to the ground after that. And then, however, when they looked at the violin, there was a crack in it because, you know, that happens to all violins, even though it has magic on it, he hit it really hard. And also he lost the D12 roll because I rolled a 12 on my D12 to see whether I was broken. But then I rolled a, uh, one of my D12 to see if they could find somebody in town who could cast mending on it. Which they did. We found oh. Kyle. <laughs> yeah. So, and that was it. That's basically it. They got the violin back. Uh, I didn't actually shoot due to time. I didn't actually get to the final part, which is basically she goes, takes it, plays the violin, all the ended spirits come back, and you save the town. Party but on, you had, Gar you had somebody who could cast mending a town. Otherwise, you all would have been fucked. <laughs> Very I mean, nice. To be fair, all you have to do is drill a small hole through the crack, and then what no. you do is you put some string through there. You get wood splints, no. and you just kind of let it dry, and that usually takes not for a that. day or two. 
ruin the. You use horse. The uh, last glue. episode that we did was episode one sixty four, Croken Pirates. It's our tri generational Margu campaigners on Sunday. Uh, they are in clearly a textbook version of the Magnificent Seven. No doubt about it. No question about it. That's got to be what it is. Rescue a party from a bunch of bad guys. I am sure there is zero twist to this game whatsoever. I think as long as they play like Eli Wallach and Steve McQueen, they are going to be successful. Bad news is they tried to hide their ship by saying, hey, go hide the ship. Not where. <laughs> Not when to come back. Uh so there might be a problem. Uh, <laughs> since I am in quite the mood, as Kyle has pointed out, uh, I ended up having the halfling shaved of all body <laughs> hair sitting in an baptismal font with uh, carrots and celery as he had a cursed ring removed. <laughs> and the pure sight of copious V bitters, buck ass naked and hairless, has caused great consternation among the other players all three of these games are in the archive now folks so if they sound interesting which they were i go ahead and take a look at them and uh give us some feedback on it if you want and again if you want to join us in one of these little adventures hit us up and we will get you in there uh now we move on to the main topic of our show and that is campaigning in the demise of an empire kyle Take it away. Bum, ba, bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 the acoustic. Bum, 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 bum. <coughs> uh, that was Jelly Roll Morton, in case none of you mm-hmm. guys got that. Anyway, yes. uh, so what? Uh, what were we going to talk about? I don't know. Uh, cool campaign ideas for uh, morons. Who oh my gosh, that out. sounds awesome! Uh, so imagine Candyland now. I don't know where I was going to go with that. Mouse trap. <laughs> mouse no mouse trap. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, any of you guys watching who was paying attention last week, uh, we talked the ascendancy of the empire, how the <laughs> empire generally works right now. And so with the decline and with all the stuff that makes an empire work in mind, we're going to just talk about, you know, everything falling apart piece by piece and some of the important things that take place in that and that you as a DM need to create. Uh, First off and foremost, factions. Uh, If you think I'm reading from my notes, you're wrong, because as you can see right here, says the first one is conflicts but i'm going with the second one first factions Factions. and so um guys why don't we talk about factions a little bit more we kind of touched on it last week uh uh frank what kind of factions are you putting inside your empire and you know how is it going to later contribute to the fall uh i am going with political allies god damn it faction Okay, I will go at... Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'll go with you two workers. first and make Frank come up with the hard <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you know what? That, that, that'll work. I, All right, I like but that idea. Since you're already going, Frank, go ahead. Political allies. Now, if that, no, David, no, if I you had that, Carol, what did you have? Go away. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to be quite convincing in my argument. Uh, okay, oh, no. anytime you're going to build an empire like... Uh, I don't know, Rome, uh, shall we say. Uh, You know what? Fuck it. No, I'm going to give David his due. I'm going to go with religious factions, and I'm going to say Atlantis. Uh, The religious orders in the empire of the Atlanteans uh, have come to a head in their disagreement as to which deity is the chief deity. Uh, They picked the wrong one, and anger ensues from the right one, because there is only one god, and his name is Zul. Praise Zul. Praise Zul. Zool. So my factions uh, are religious orders. Sure. Different, different groups. So quick question. And say like the world that uh, 5e is currently running in, where all the gods are real. How does that work? Where you're like, no, but one of those gods, even though I've met 
three of them already. One of them is definitely better than the other. One of them is the patron patron deity of that empire. You know, uh, you can't be Catholic and believe in Allah. So if you, if you're an agnostic, you can. Uh, but if you're a true diehard uh, born again Christian, there is no Allah. There is only Jesus Christ superstar. So for the Atlanteans, uh, <laughs> their God is uh, SpongeBob nice. SquarePants. And no other deities are no, allowed. Squidward or no. Squidward. Well, it turns out that Squidward was the correct one, and he used his clarinet to sink Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carol, let's talk about more inside factions of an empire and what's causing the empire to fall and how they are participating in it. Hmm, how's it going in the campaign now? Because that's a great one right now about an empire falling. <laughs> that's because the DM is spectacular. He is. <laughs> I'm really. Oh, she's kissing ass now, Frank. <laughs> really is. Yeah, now, now that she's found out she's fucking dead you know Sunday, you know Saturday. That's really funny. I kiss ass to make things worse for my characters, not better, because Frank knows that's what I. Do. You do realize you're supposed to use those favors to move up in the world, right? Yes, I know. <laughs> supposed to work all right but that's 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 those are a few of her favorite things actions man um let's see i i actually i'll go with more of a political uh type oh! thing. <laughs> shush shush this actually is also relevant right there david right there just bend over <laughs> no sorry well, under sorry. the bus <laughs> Well, you might be able to do a different take on it, too, uh, than what I'm doing. I mean, to me, there's a lot that political can be a fairly wide range of of things. But in in my case, uh, to, to put in my setting, there is a faction in the bad kingdom that uh, is trying to uh, basically someone has had enough. And I'm not going to give spoilers because. I may play this out. It may be able to jam this out, hopefully in the future. But there is somebody who does, who has had enough of that fucking kingdom, uh, the oppressive regime. They've they've kept her down. They've kept the man down. So she is. Uh, she wants to lead a revolt oh, man. and a coup, basically a coup, a coup, a coup against the kingdom. So. You have you can have those type of factions, you know. To me, that is a faction, and she is working directly against the king, even though they don't know it. It's a secret. It's a secret faction. So that's all right. That. David, David, what do you got for me? Okay, I'll expound upon that. God damn it! Uh, two political <laughs> factions, one loyal to an emperor. <laughs> there we go. The loyalists. The other Please. faction wants to unseat the emperor. They feel that, you know, killing the emperor, you know, will, you know, release the, the will create a political vacuum and they can install, you know, a successor. But unfortunately, the emperor has children, <laughs> you know, that are rightful successors. So, yeah, that's my political intrigue. There you go. Very nice. Very nice. You a have two your political loyalty. system, folks. Yeah, always. Oh, works. yeah. It'll it'll destroy everything. Yep. Yeah, no, I think uh, if I were to add anything to that, I would just make uh, the dissidents, the uh, ill contents at being conquered, the yes. conquerees. Yep. They're always a good political, or not even a political faction, just a good faction in general. Slaves, and Spartacus. Slaves, Spartacus. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now, what about uh, uh, outside of your empire? I mean, we do have other countries, right, who are mm -hmm. still eyeballing the empire like, okay, they're going to come at some point because they have to conquer us to get this good shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else have we got? And this time, we'll start <laughs> with David. And maybe throw in a bit more uniqueness as far as, you know, this is a fantasy setting. What have you guys got? Hmm. Okay. Uh, forces outside the empire, of course, rival empires. 
Uh, okay, uh, vying for territory, uncharted territory. Mm-hmm. See who gets there first. You know, <coughs> uh, could be that somebody does get there first, plants that flag. Um, but you know, of course, you got the rival empire who wants there to stake their claim could have it to where the two empires feud over that that new swath of geography so and you know one of them uh, befriends the local natives and the Mm -hmm. other one builds fortresses in the middle of the midwest and yeah (laughs) there starts the indian wars there you go (laughs) So, but yeah, no, uh, I would, I would have it as uh, an expansion, you know, uh, two empires buying for expansion. So. Sure. Okay. Carol. Um, well, I said to keep, keep it in my setting, uh, yeah. speaking of that kingdom that has the faction working against them, it is not now it's no secret at all that they have designs on the good kingdom that the PCs tend to be where i tend to run my games out of mm-hmm. so absolutely they're a threat and at some point they are planning on making a move it's just that so it said i'd like to think that things are somewhat complicated in my world uh they want to make a move but this 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 third party is a total wild card in their plans and as i said if what happened if, you know what i said if i run it uh if i run it with you guys <clears throat> sorry if i run it with you guys you may actually help determine what happens in in the world uh, and how that all plays out. You may end up allying with this wild card to go against that kingdom. I'll or take you that may back. Or you, or <laughs> the third faction is the Fredo of the family. <laughs> you may, or you may not. I mean, there's, there's, there's reasons why you wouldn't want to either. But yeah, in my world, absolutely. The outside, the outside, the outside bad guys are the other king, the oppressive regime that wants to take over the uh, the free land, so to speak, the free kingdom. Sure. Okay. And Frank, let's end with you. I mean, uh, what else have you got there that to add to it? The uh, continent of Pangaea, which is home to Fartuk, uh, on the far end has the uh, Melkor Empire, a.k.a. Uh, trojans and or roman empire uh these bastards are expansionists and they have uh dove into various territories but as they go into the mountainous regions that is home to the dwarven lords and they (laughs) have an air force made out of griffins uh and the melkor people are going to have to figure out how to shoot shit (laughs) down before they can go forward uh, because they are getting knocked on the noggin with a bunch of rocks from the flying birds. Sure. All right. Uh, Man, that's the factions. Now let's talk about actual conflicts then. I mean, we have the participants. Now, how are these participants involved in the actual destruction of the empire? I mean, is their original plan that they want to see this empire fall or are they just so caught up in their own greed for money and power that they don't really care what happens to the empire, provided they get one, both, hmm. or the other? I think I'm supposed to say one, the other, or both. There we go. Cut that earlier part out, Carrie, please, and then just change it to that. But then also <laughs> take out this part that I'm doing right here so no one knows like we really do any editing come on (laughs) yeah well i i can dream maybe one day when we put this on a podcast where people listen to it we'll cut out the stupid parts like this (laughs) he's gone on a tangent cut it out no, all right, all right, all right. I'll make it through we're all gonna sound like a bunch of idiots so you're gonna hear and that was carol (laughs) besides they talk over me so much so you can't really hear me anyways that was carol so we'll move on to frank's opinion (laughs) (laughs) all right frank let's start off with you this time uh maybe you'll steal some of these guys idea what are the inside conflicts what's happening inside the empire whether it's at your political 
your religious station or down with the slaves? What kind of conflicts are brewing that's going to be part of the downfall of an empire? I'll go ahead and stick with uh, the Melkor Empire. Uh, Inside, uh, you have two different factions. One's the the expansionists uh, who say, fuck everybody, let their deities sort them out. And the other one saying, we need to go a little bit slower. We need to fortify our borders. We have to get good fortresses there, have forward sections that can go ahead and take it, have close supply lines. Uh, in that area, the emperor is going to have to decide which one he wants to go through. Most likely since expansionists are dirty, rotten SOBs. No, not Republicans, uh, because the Melkors follow rules. Uh, but they will go ahead and let the emperor know that, you know, if you don't want to wake up with an asp in your bed, you'll go with further expansion. Uh, for the religion, I didn't go with any religion with the Melkor Empire just because you know, Trojan, Roman, uh, they don't give a shit whose God you pray to. They know that uh, might makes right. Uh, so my group, expansionists versus uh, more cautious members. Sure. So maybe the Empire trying to appease both you end up not expanding far enough to actually take out the people who are serious and you never actually fortify that wall well enough that when they do come, they get stopped at the wall. The uh, halflings in the Glen to the North would most likely align with the dwarves. Uh, The halflings are ferocious fighters on their sheep cavalry uh, and flanked and low flanked by the Griffin riders. Uh, (laughs) Uh, there are going to be a whole lot of red capes floating around. Damn, Griffin Riders. All right. Dave, what are the inner conflicts that you see happening with an empire that's going to cause it to collapse? Uh, cutting off trade supply. You know, like uh, the Huns uh, taking control of the Silk Road, uh, attacking all the feudal states uh, until they get uh, control of the viable trade routes in uh uh, cut off routes to the resources, take control of the resources, and then, yeah, kind of force the, the empire. It's just like, uh, you know, you want this stuff, you got to pay. So, uh, and if they don't, just um, starve them or whatever, cause start causing economic instability and just kind of watch the whole empire collapse on itself. So... That's what I got. <laughs> You're muted. I'm I'm muted. No, Kyle. Oh. Oh, I was about to say, oh. God damn it, that was a good speech. <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah. No. So we got some inside conflicts with Frank outside with uh, David, Carol. You know, uh, I brought up in this well-written sheet mm-hmm. that there is a third aspect that can cause a collapse in the empire, which is you know. Just straight up natural disasters. They spend their fortunes. I'm not even going to friggin' go there because that's, I don't have natural disasters in my. uh, uh, You're missing out, is what I'm hearing. What? No, 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 no. I I was always, because I was thinking, oh, what the inner conflicts would be, of course, that third faction, you know, working against that would be for the, the One Kingdom and then. How they would do it is they would base. Well, actually, it's funny because initially this is what's really weird. So initially, the way I thought, way I thought of how the kingdom, the one kingdom was going to take over the other was they were going to go right for the jugular. They were going to go take out the ruling party, the ruling, the rulers of the kingdom. Um, and chaos can happen after that. So I, my whole thing was about chaos. But one of the things I, I actually considered while uh, about doing this was actually having a, a, a creating a magic uh, a powerful magic spell that would cause like a massive tidal wave to swamp the city I, as a in some ways even as a distraction so that it could get somebody in to take out the leader so it, I, I, it's funny it actually I did consider that um, and absolutely because if you think about natural disasters I mean you know, usually they take out a lot of, they, they'll kill a lot of people. I mean, they'll take out, they'll take out your economy. They destroy all your buildings, your shops, your, 
<clears throat> um, they can destroy your farms, you know, depending on what kind of a, a society it is. You think, if you think about it, that right there, absolutely. I mean, how about the, you know, how about a pandemic? Look at what the pandemic has done to to the not I'm even not just sure I know what you're talking well, about. That, Carol. That's just lazy writing. It's just pandemic. really lazy writing. Yeah, yeah. Right, but it's but it is something you can look at as how the effects of something like that can affect economies, can affect can affect people. And it's how many how honestly how many times before we had this pandemic have we had apocalypse stories based on pandemics? You know, it's it's not it's not a new concept. I was about to say you're in one. <laughs> oh, what's that? Uh, the pirates of the Caribbeans. You better start believing in ghost stories, Mister. Because you're in one. You're in yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's weird. It's weird. I mean, it, it's funny because uh, what was it? it? Was the very beginning when New York was getting hit hard, and they had the National Guard showing up to one of the towns right outside and I'm looking at that going, this just became that freaking apocalypse horror that I've been seeing in the movies all these years. You know, it's just like, this is weird. It's life is now Zombies. imitating art. And then Rick Grimes showed up and everything got a whole lot better till they killed Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, gosh, I'm, having a brain fart where we were at. We were talking about natural disasters good, causing yeah. conflicts. And the great thing about that, you know, with a fantasy world is that you can easily tie one of those earthquakes, tidal waves over to an evil wizard who really fucking hates the Empire. I mean, <coughs> the other thing I just absolutely loved, though, was this idea of using a, a volcano explosion on the other side of the world and causing complete and utter havoc. I mean, there was one out in, yeah, in the somewhere. Pacific, Krakatoa. Is that the one I'm thinking of, Krakatoa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Raised the world's temperature by one degree. Mm -hmm. And then also made winters worse over in the Midwest and or Europe. Maybe <laughs> one or the other, Europe. maybe both. I don't remember. Which caused crops to fail, and you know. An empire runs on its stomach without the bread, you know. Circuses can only entertain the people so much. And speaking of which, you know, uh, as, as your empire is collapsing, whether it's because of uh, political dissension, you know, the empire dies and suddenly there's 50 people who are next in line to rule or the slaves start revolting and now the upper class common citizens you bet they stink on ice <laughs> <laughs> that one's an obscure one <laughs> or a plague is happening how are you guys changing how your npcs are reacting to the world around them how is how's the background thing a prices inflation uh, little Timmy is sticking his feet out from under a newspaper because he caught the COVID-48 and is dead. What's going on in the background that your PCs are going to be like, oh, yeah, what? Uh, yeah, something horrible is uh, happening all around us. And we'll start with David on that one. Uh, yeah. Cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. Ah! Um, no, how about they turn to religion and start blaming the gods for the misfortune until they piss off a god and then it gets even gets worse. Real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because in that in natural disasters and things like that in and throughout history, I mean, people did turn to religion and whatever for sure. explanations. I mean, you know, even modern society, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, look at you know, <coughs> Christianity, you know, with the, the Bible, you know, the you know, revelations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, revelations and stuff like that. So, yeah, of course, the prophets and false prophets come out and, you know, clerics, you know. Yeah, you know, the gods for what? it. So, so yeah, that's what sure. I got. 
the temples start filling up. All right, Carol, mm-hmm. what do you got? How's the world reacting to this that the players actually see as they walk down the streets of the empire? You know what? I, 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 all I can think about was, and this is, this is in the campaign, was us in Yaddle with the, um, the food prices. I remember there's a food shortage in Yaddle and the prices were higher and, he, and it said that it, they were going to be higher next week because the food was getting more and more scarce. Yeah, That's, women were like, uh, selling themselves to get extra money and you insulted yeah, them to right. death. But how, I mu- think- how much was that? Uh, because they wanted to feed their child. <laughs> you know what? I was going to say. I Worth those- it. That's how much it was. Those women, those women, I'm sure, were selling themselves before there was a food shortage. Oh, but- <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Well, to cast divine sense on that. <laughs> Judgment Day is here. <laughs> <laughs> I found one of the apocalypse <laughs> writers right here. Frank always has a few hookers in every town he friggin' builds. So, you know. Uh, World's oldest profession. World's oldest profession. Have you found any insult yet? If if you light a human being, you might be able to spot some. (laughs) I didn't say it was wrong either. I mean, it's accurate. It's it's everywhere you go. Roxanne, you don't Um, have to put that red light on. That's the one. I mean, I haven't really thought about it from my world yet. Um, because again, I also don't really know what's going to happen. So, you know, that's like a bridge I'm going to cross, but, but yeah, as soon as you're talking about it, all I can think about is yaddle and with the, with the, the food and such and, uh, oh Lord. And also with the, and after all the friggin' destruction, it'll be that city is basically, I think destroyed. And I mean, they're going to be people. Yeah. Everyone's now just either, it's really a hard existence there. I would imagine we've left. So, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen and this campaign's going to come to the, it come to an end before we, we would ever see what's going to happen there. But, but yeah, that's, that's the thing that came, I said right now in the campaign, we're literally living like the downfall. I, it's not really even empire, but of these cities. So it's, it's, say, it's, yeah, it's well, definitely it's, not an empire, but it's bad. No, but it's a, it's a much, you know, it's, it's still, it's still got some, you know, it's still, it's a smaller scale, but it's similar effects. Sure. Yeah. So I find it very interesting that this, this came up uh, on this week before the campaign goes and it's, and we are, we're literally trying to prevent. I think it was the, fucking the planned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Planned. yeah. Yeah. I know. Well, I, well, I, I don't I'm not sure it was originally planned because originally it was going to be a one week discussion till Kyle got all of uppity and said, we need to talk about this multiple weeks. This is way too big a topic. And he was right. It is way too big a topic for one week. Scott, what? Kyle, <laughs> Kyle was right. Oh, oh man. Oh, once in a while, it's right. Just wait man. until 55 years. I'll be right all the time. It'll be annoying. Exactly. <laughs> big head. All right. Uh, I was going to go with Frank, but I saw the time and we're Aww. already kind of seeing Frank demonstrate his ability to show uh, uh, humanity collapsing all around us due to the evils of a box. Oh, God, the box. Yep, yep. <laughs> there you go. Um, Tara. Wait, what, what did it say? Don't Tara, worry about it, Carol, because we're going to keep it, going was it, was on. It, was it, was it my name on a freaking tombstone? I couldn't read it. Sorry. Could be, yeah. <laughs> All right, but moving on to PCs in general, uh, let's talk about the actual campaign. You know, we have the setting. It's the collapse of an empire. I think uh, uh, most of you guys are thinking, okay, if the PCs are playing this, and I think if PCs were actually playing it and you give them the choice, they want to be the architects of the demise that is this empire. <laughs> And so, yeah, right? So Maybe you as the DM, what kind of quest, what kind of side quests, um, what's the general arc uh, that's going into the, uh, 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 the collapse of the Empire and how the PCs are engineering <clears throat> it? Or rather to say how you are engineering it for the PCs to actually do that. And with that, I'm going to start with Frank because I skipped him last time. How are you doing that? What are, what are they doing? 
This one ties into what would have been my answer. Uh, they are going to join a syndicate or a gang uh, in order to survive. Uh, ergo, when it's time for them to advance, the big head honcho, uh, Don Corleone, uh, gives them the marching orders that, hey, we're running low on this. Go out and get it. And through a series of misadventures, the PCs will indubitably fuck something up and make it worse. Because I know my PCs. Yeah, like <laughs> kill a crime boss and try to hide his body. <laughs> With his feet sticking out. Yeah, that didn't work so well for you, did it? Killing guards in mines. <laughs> I just you know, letting loose an elephant in Fink. No burning a fucking bridge. The only bridge over the gap. Yeah, that, yeah, that sounds like normal everything shit. Perfect freaking North anyway, North. David, what are your PCs doing to engineer this demise of the Empire? <coughs> exactly what you just said. They're burning bridges. <laughs> Cutting off <laughs> communication, you know? No, no, I like the idea of, uh, yeah, the gang thing, you know, mm -hmm. mob rule kind of thing. And, you know, to get in and infiltrate the empire or whatever, you become member of this, you know, shadow faction or something like that, you know? So Run, shadow of... faction. <laughs> <laughs> Dice. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no see when you're 55 no bam, actually come in and actually start a whisper campaign or something like that you know to kind of orchestrate the demise of this you know empire that's on its last last breath you know before you know sure you go um, in and take over <laughs> so is that generally what you're thinking the pc's idea is when they decide to turn against the empire is they want the rule themselves they want to be the pc emperors or are, are the npcs around them making promises to them or just pointing out the flaws that is the empire it's like yeah this empire runs on slaves it could run on undead people and there would be no slaves i like that idea <laughs> <laughs> How are your uh, quest givers, you know, how are they hooking the PCs into, yeah, no, let's let's burn this mother down to the ground. Burn, burn, burn this mother down, Pookie. Um, I'm, and that's no, an open-ended question to anyone at this time. Yeah, n no, no, uh, I like, I like the whole end to slavery uh, thing like that, that perhaps slaves... And the slave trade is what kept this empire afloat. So, you know, he's, you know, kind of, you know, doing the whole whisper thing and saying, you know, we need, of, of course, people are going to want to dissolve the slave trade and stuff like that. So, I don't know. Slaves are people too. They are. So, uh, empires, they are. <laughs> human, uh, human currency, folks, you know, so... Sure. All right. But, what were you, Carol? Sorry, David. Did I interrupt? No. What? <laughs> Damn it. Wait, so what's the question, Mantic? Because I didn't get to answer. <laughs> the original what? question was, you know, what kind, what's the quest, what's the arc that you have the PCs going on if they're orchestrating the fall oh, of this is... empire? And, you know, also how your NPCs are hooking them into wanting the empire to fall. Mm, well, that's kind of depend you know i realized something we're probably running my campaign or whatever you want to call it with this group of people probably is a bad idea because they'll probably pick for the evil kingdom to survive uh, but if i was gonna all right so let's say uh, downfall as i said once again i like i like the whole thing about ca causing chaos send them on little missions to sabotage things about the town Sabotage. Sure. Okay. That, that's that's as simple as that. Um, you know, cause a distraction so an attack force can get in and and blow up the castle or whatever. You know, things like that. Or if they're high level enough level, they're the elite task force going in to blow up the castle. Sure. Okay. 
Uh, and then the other side of the coin, I mean, there are bystanders, but this is a campaign setting. You Your mean PCs... XP? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. there you go. In which case, uh, uh, and I wrote on here survivors, and eh, maybe that's not the correct term, maybe loyalist to the empire, empire itself. They see the empire as this golden rule that's protecting everyone from descending into hellish chaos, you know, and your PCs decide to side on that. This is something I doubt most PCs would choose unless they were really interested in trying that side of it. But what kind of quests are they running trying to hold this empire together? And we're talking about the collapse of an empire. Are they actually going to be able to stop the collapse of the empire or... Uh, is it just doomed from the start? Uh, and we'll start with Carol on that one so she doesn't forget the question. Come yeah. on, Kyle. Hmm. I mean, Carol. Well, no, it wasn't that I'd forgotten the question. It's the fact that you asked a follow-up, so I wasn't sure if I was answering the first one or the second one. Uh, but in this case, so how how would they... So it's easy. They would, if I'm, since I'm sabotaging causing chaos, the PCs would have to go fix the avatar or prevent it from happening. They'd be sent out to different areas to deal with problems and maybe stop the task force that's going in to blow up the castle to, to go to go cut them off and, uh, you know, either take them out or, you know, knock them out and have them thrown in jail and such. Sure, that's thanks. How I do it. That's, that's how I've done it and how I do it. Yeah. Okay. David? Um... How about an impending invasion from a rival empire and your PCs are help uh, move refugees out of the empire into, mm. uh, uh, you know, havens? Harriet Tubman. There yeah. Go, an underground Under railroad. Yeah. Okay. So in your situation, we're seeing the PCs mitigate the fall of their empire exactly they say they stop it they see it as just like this this is going to fall there's no stopping it you know so so sure. let's try to save as many as we can so okay and frank you know we've heard secret missions mitigating the fall um any political way that this party is trying to stop it from falling or what That's ideas really do you also have on top of that <laughs> I'm going with political. I'm going to say that uh, the loyalists realize that the current emperor, king, leader uh, is unfit for office. They are going to lobby either for a military coup or for a stronger, possibly younger, possibly more compliant uh, member of the bloodline and install them. Little do they know it was Lord Bushmill's son and the fuckers already killed him. He's already dead. <laughs> Uh, so their quest goes unfulfilled, leading to the destruction of the universe. I appreciate that you led the possibility of, yeah, the evil, the PCs are going to be evil. They want this young child to be the new emperor god king. Because he oh, now, now history us. is replete with that. History it is. is it is. So. All right. All right. Nine o'clock. We're going to end on final thoughts. Summing up what we've talked about last time, what we talked about this time, we have the Empire, the rise, the glorious middle section, the inevitable fall of it. Where are you guys going to set your campaign? What's the hook to get your players interested? Are you doing 1 through 10th level or doing 1 through 20 from the beginning of the Empire to the fall of the Empire? Uh, and then final thoughts, if you want to add that on there. And with that, let's start with David. Pick one. Oh. <laughs> well, I didn't want someone who would talk forever. And, I like but that. I know that I have to end with you at some point, Carol. So. <laughs> I like the idea of uh, starting your campaign, you know, level one during the ascension of the Empire and then you know, you're level 20 plus and, you know, you've lived to see the Empire fall. So, and that's that the campaign. That is going to be some serious destruction 
as yes. far as falling because it's like, you know, yeah, between levels 15 through 20, epic tier D&D has <laughs> something truly epic has to so, bring this exactly. empire down. <laughs> Ask oh Kevin. yeah, something terrible. The town just have a terrasque. Hey, we yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> they find a scroll of terrasque. The PCs exactly. are taking it down. <laughs> or what is it? The scroll of meteors? <laughs> you know? There we go. There we go. <laughs> or or the comet or something. Positive I don't know. Faster. Sure. All right, Carol. On to you. Your campaign setting is taking place in the Empire. Where? Where are your PCs going to start at it? Where are they going to end? And, you know, what's happening? What's the general level, arc? Level-wise, I, you know, my, my whole point of view, I like level three because that to me is where you really define who your character is. Um, uh, and you know what? As for how I just basically, I, you know, I don't have like a set level thing. I just run it and go by the story. And however long it goes, it goes. You know, as long as I can keep cranking out content, we'll see how much content I can crank out because I'm just, yeah, I'm just friggin' Unless still. Unless you're like Frank or Matt Mercer. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Frank, Frank is, is tired. Frank is a... Normally that would give Frank a big head, but he doesn't actually know who Matt Mercer is. So it's he okay. has no idea. He, he <laughs> totally knows who he is. But that All is right, Carol, it. real quick though. Uh, <laughs> what about in the lifespan of the Empire? Where do you think you're setting this campaign? Beginning, middle, just maybe all in the middle? Oh, middle it's, 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 I said, it's the, it's the one, I'm, it's the one that you guys saw the very beginnings of uh, in that first, the first one shot I ran. Uh, no, it's it's in the middle. It's in the it's in the probably the glory years, uh, before the downfall of somebody. So it's that somebody's gonna fall, but the PCs are gonna help determine who's gonna fall. Uh, Jody determines that none of them fall, and they all get hugs and love. Mm, hugs uh, and they love die. And... Jody probably just don't steal any good... apples. Jody all right, probably... Frank. <laughs> let's go ahead and on with you. Four to twelve. This campaign. Four to twelve. Four to twelve. It's at the end. Uh, I start them at four because I want them to survive. Twelve because you get four to six twelfth level characters. That's some serious shit. Uh, their end goal is to bring about the downfall of the empire and carve out their own nation, partially involving the old empire, partially involving a border area where they have. Uh, extended their reach of power sure. all hmm. right well with that guys let's do final thoughts you know what's the important thing we learned about the descendancy and do you guys actually have an inspiration on what someone should watch read about as far as you know really bringing life into the death of their empire i'm gonna stick with that because i like it carol go ahead start first inspiration and What's important about learning the descendancy? I don't and then really, say bye. No, I don't really. Wait, wait. What's the whole question again? <laughs> Pay attention, Carol. All right, David, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, you want to go then? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. About... Well, mm, inspiration of uh, things that you should watch. If you want to. Uh, if you want to watch videos on the complete series of what we just discussed, there is a YouTube channel called Hello Future Me, and the YouTuber that does that does uh, a three-part series on the rise of civilizations to its downfall. So it's good, good stuff. Okay. So. Frank, what do you got? Final thoughts? Uh, any document, well, most of the documentaries on Amazon, uh, particularly of the Third Reich Nazis uh, and or the Roman Empire, because you will find a lot of synonymous information where they both made the same mistakes. Uh, key point to the fall of the empire, got to be the PCs. Get it done, boys and girls. You want to carve it? You want to be 12th level? You want to own that kingdom? You want to be some kind of overlord? Break the empire first. All right. And Carol. All right. Well, all right. So inspiration. I was thinking more of like, you know, some of the stuff on History Channel, too, is pretty, pretty good in terms of falls of empires and such. <laughs> um, 
but he actually no i agree with frank it's 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 and in mind it's going to definitely be about the pcs and the decisions and what they do sure it should be about it or uh, say right. they could say they could try to say too i don't see why that's not on the table but we're trying hail to do satan. hail satan, hail <laughs> satan. Yeah. Sure. yeah. All right. And two. Who's the <laughs> dissenter? You know. <laughs> All right, guys. And with that, that is the end of Between the Rules. Frank, if you want to read off the thing of people to tell. Follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive if you want to buy our stuff and support us. Or if you want to shoot the shit uh, in our Discord channel, both links are down there. Most importantly, if you want to play or be on the talk show, M Hobo Inc., Twitter gmail hit us up let us know don't forget to uh check out oddfishgames.com for their how to rpg with your cat week from sunday at 3 p.m eastern <laughs> with, with that i think we all uh wave tell people to get the hell off the show and uh we dig um, around oh two uh, words well. croaking t-shirts fans petition frank <laughs> <laughs> croaking t-shirts